Okay, good morning and welcome. Uh, we continue in the exciting uh, study of the book of Acts. We'll pray and then we'll uh, get into our session for today. Um, I just request someone from the class to please go ahead and lead us in a, in a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, the entire Rock of Fiji wants to say thank you for this moment. Thank you for giving us opportunity to be in your presence. Thank you because we are faithful. Thank you for the lecturers. Thank you for the students. Receive all the glory in the name of Jesus. Lord, we commit this lecture to your hands, Lord. Father, uphold us and sustain us and let your spirit dwell in us. Give us all the stand of your word day by day in the name of Jesus. Father, we say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Um, so, you know, so far we've seen a couple of things happening in the church of Jerusalem. We said that the first 10 years was a time when the church in Jerusalem became stronger uh, once the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, was was done like uh, from the the book of um, from uh, Acts chapter two, the believers were now beginning to uh, uh, be added to the church, and we also saw how uh, the disciples who were waiting for this baptism in the Holy Spirit became a really firebrand. Um, uh, Christians and they went around sharing the gospel, moving in signs, wonders and miracles and we saw how persecution also affected the church but in the midst of these things the church remained a strong and a very very powerful unit. So now from Acts chapter 6 we see the governance of the church begin to change. We saw certain needs emerging in the uh, church of Jerusalem and then you know the um, emergence of uh, the volunteers. It's thus far, uh, all the primary responsibilities were those of the apostles. Uh, but now we have volunteers in the church, uh, men of God who are enlisted in Acts chapter 6 who were uh, those with good testimony and filled with the Holy Spirit, people of faith who start to serve in the church. And then we went on and we saw that in the period of persecution, somebody like Stephen, again, you know, he has the same uh, qualifications of the volunteers that I just stated. But beyond that, his conviction for uh, his faith, his conviction to stand up for the Lord Jesus and to preach Jesus, when he is cornered by um, you know several several opposers uh, that's something very uh, exemplary and something to uh, really honor and praise uh, and stephen gives us a very good example a man of faith unfortunately we saw that stephen was martyred uh, and uh, it was a brutal um, you know killing that he he underwent um, and uh, in this whole uh, scenario we we noticed that there was a name that was mentioned to us by luke and that is saul uh, we saw how saul was the one who uh, was seemingly leading this group of opposers who killed stephen now we must also recognize that what was what happened to stephen uh, probably that may have happened to others as well we don't know but then uh, the situation was so serious and that's what Luke wants to bring to our attention. Now we went on to Acts chapter 8 and again there is a description of persecution and how Saul was leading that persecution without any mercy. He was not concerned about the gender of the person or um, you know whether they were, uh, they were at home because it says he went they even went to the homes and dragged people out. So literally without any mercy, people were being persecuted for their faith. But in such a time, we also see the spread of the gospel. We also see that uh, people in the church of Jerusalem, uh, right now, Philip, who is a volunteer, we see him moving out of Jerusalem and going to a place called as Samaria, where he um, not only does he preach the word, but with signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, uh, we saw that once people start to believe in Samaria, uh, another important thing that takes place is uh, 
the discipling of of these believers because john peter and john from the church of jerusalem they set out to come to samaria uh, so that they can help the believers now what is the help required for the believers they need to be moved on to the next level or the next important thing uh, the next truth that must be taught to them uh, and so peter and john come and they minister the baptism in the holy spirit now we know that when they laid hands uh, to minister the baptism in the holy spirit uh, simon the sorcerer he observed something amazing first of all he had given his uh, life to christ but then uh, you know when he saw the infilling of the holy spirit and uh, people uh, probably you know he he noticed them moving in the in the gift of tongues so he asked he asked um, peter and he said that hey can i have this gift uh, for an amount of money and peter rebukes him and he says that your heart is not right uh, repent before god uh, let's hope that god forgives you so that's where we actually stop so there are a lot of things going on uh, we will notice that in the next 10 years the first initial years is about a decade uh, and we seen whatever transpired uh, we saw that the church has now grown to um, you know several thousand people we have leaders in the church we have volunteers in the church uh, persecution is going on but now from acts chapter 8 to acts chapter 13 is uh, the period of the next 10 years or the next decade roughly we can estimate it from ad 38 to uh, ad 47 and what we will see uh, in these next uh, five chapters or so is the way the gospel is spreading in the surrounding region uh, so till acts chapter 7 it was all about the church of jerusalem but now it's moving on to the neighboring places we've already seen the name of samaria uh, in acts chapter 8 and then you know we will see other names listed out later as well so what can uh, we expect you know uh, the the uh, believers to do in um, this uh, upcoming five chapters we'll see that they go and they carry the revival fires almost uh, we know that what happened in the initial years of the church was nothing less than a revival so that same revival they carry it to uh, other parts you know wherever they go but the beauty of what we are going to learn is we notice that the same dna or in other words uh, the same kind of fervor for god the same kind of desire for the power of god the same kind of uh, earnestness to preach the gospel the same kind of uh, interest to build the church the things like that they carry that same fire so it's nothing less than what was happening in the church of jerusalem and so that is an encouragement for us today because when we Uh, you know take the passion that we have and the uh, uh, you know the that fire that we have experienced in god uh, what happens is you kind of ignite the same kind of fire wherever you go so uh, we see that in the, in the book of acts and uh, uh, similarly today we can expect that whatever we are receiving whatever we are um, learning whatever god is doing in our lives that's something we can carry and we can give it out uh, wherever the lord leads us and so uh, we notice in the book of acts that as the revival fire spread out um, there were believing communities there were communities that came alive with the truth of god that came alive with the power of god and that's what we expect today when we talk about church planting that's what we want the fire of revival you know moves from place to place and then you don't just have one minister uh, who is carrying the revival fire but you have an entire community that's carrying the revival fire and that's how you know it's it's uh, supposed to be and uh, that's something that we can dream about and say god you know we want to see communities that are so uh, passionate for you uh, in our times and days as well so what else uh, are we going to see in these three in these next five chapters uh, we've already heard the name of saul that you know he was uh, such a devout jew uh, that he he went against anything that stood up uh, you know as a as a threat to his faith uh, so he was persecuting the followers of the lord jesus um, and uh, uh, that's as much as we learned about him but 
as we go to chapter 9 there's going to be quite an elaborate description of how he encounters the presence of god and you know how uh, jesus speaks to him and how this man saul uh, you know we later on uh, call him uh, paul uh, you know both both were his names but then uh, for some reason uh, the other name was was called um, uh, later so people know him by the, that name paul uh, you know once he has an encounter with god uh, so that's something that we learn about and then eventually we'll see how paul uh, in association with the church of uh, jerusalem uh, you know he he is instrumental uh, he's instrumental along with you know, some of the other leaders to to really build up uh, a church called as the church of Antioch, Antioch of Syria. So we'll talk about that church and the speciality of that church. And then uh, eventually, you know, we will see how um, by Acts chapter 13, God will specify that uh, he wants Paul and Barnabas for a certain kind of a ministry, which obviously we know uh, is the ministry of uh, you know, like uh, um, a missionary kind of a role that uh, God wants Paul to have and even Barnabas. And so in Acts chapter 13, God makes that very clear. And then uh, we will start to talk about the um, missionary journeys of Paul. So the encounter that Paul had with Jesus uh, took place somewhere around AD 38. Okay, so uh, that's um, a little bit about what we are going to see in the next five chapters so let's go back in and uh, begin to see what we have here in the passage so acts 8 we've already seen christ being preached in samaria then the profession of the sorcerer's faith we've seen that and we've seen how um, uh, simon has something wrong in his heart and he's being rebuked for that uh, and now we will start to read about the life of uh, Philip, who is another one of the volunteers and what exactly Philip does. I know we probably read a little bit already, but um, let's uh, start again from Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. That's the place where we will begin. So I want to request um, somebody from our class to go ahead and uh, read this portion. You can read from 26 and go on. Okay, till the end, you could just go on till the end. And then we'll, we'll see what we can learn from this. Yeah, sure. Acts chapter... 8 verse 26 now an angel of the lord spoke to philip saying arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from jerusalem to gaza this is desert so he rose and went and behold a man of ethiopia a eunuch of great authority under the candence the queen of the ethiopians who had charge of all her treasury had come to jerusalem to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to be slaughtered and as a lamb before his its shearer is silent. So he opened not its mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the inner answered Philip and said, I ask you of whom the prophet say, say this, of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began, and beginning of the scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, 
and he answered and said i believe that jesus christ is the son of god so he commanded the chariot to stand still and both philip and enid went down into the water and he baptized him now when they came up out of the water the spirit of the lord caught philip away so that enid saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing but philip was found at azotus and passing through he preached in all the cities till he came to caesarea Okay, thank you, Jethina. Thank you for that. Um, so we are seeing here that uh, from Samaria, right? Philip receives an instruction. Uh, we can say that similar to Stephen, um, Philip was also a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit, who was uh, so sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit. It's obviously the Spirit of God who gave Stephen the wisdom to speak the way he did earlier. Uh, and in this case, uh, in this entire chapter of uh, uh, chapter 8, we see that Philip is led by God so beautifully, so powerfully. Uh, he went to Samaria and uh, as uh, the mighty works of God were done, there was great joy in Samaria. We, we talked about that. So an entire region was impacted by the ministry of one man. Uh, and that is such an encouragement for us. Now, God leads him from that place to another place. Okay. Uh, so that again, he can go and he can speak. Uh, about salvation and the Lord Jesus to uh, another person. But notice how Philip is being led to places where people seem to have their hearts uh, yearning to hear the truth. So when he went to Samaria, it was so amazing and uh, efficient, successful. Now, being led by the Spirit, he comes to uh, you know another region. So he receives the instruction, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So a specific place is given to Philip. How does he recognize? Uh, we are told that angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. So these are all ways uh, by which the prophetic word is given to us or the communication of God comes to us. So right now, it's an angel, right? So sometimes an angel can come and speak to us about what God wants us to do. Now, we've seen this in the Bible, uh, in the case of Mary. Gabriel came to Mary and spoke to her and said, told her what is going to happen. So Philip receives an instruction and that instruction is go to a certain place. Now, what did Philip do? So when we receive an instruction from God, uh, the right thing is to follow through. So he goes, we see in verse 27, so he arose and went. And over there, there is a person and it says a man of Ethiopia. Okay, what was this man doing? Uh, later on, we find that he came to worship uh, in Jerusalem. So maybe you know, he was a proselyte. Proselyte is somebody who is given to other faiths, but who decides to follow uh, Judaism. So as a proselyte, he had come to worship in Jerusalem. Now, this uh, Ethiopian, uh, we are also told a little bit more about this person that uh, he was a eunuch of great authority okay so for whatever reason uh, he's he's a eunuch but the important point to note here is he has great authority uh, or in our present day terms he must have been a government official of a very high rank uh, and uh, somehow god led philip to a high-ranking official. Uh, we are told that he was under the Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. So Candace may, may be a term used to describe a certain uh, you know, form of royalty or certain form of uh, uh, position in the palace. So uh, he was under the, the hierarchy or, or the, the king or the, or the queen. And uh, we noticed that uh, he also had charge of the treasury right treasury 
So we can foresee that something strategic is going to happen. All right. Now, does Philip know? How much information did Philip have? We have so much information about this uh, Ethiopian eunuch. But uh, how much information do you think Philip had when God told him to go there? Anyone? Yes, nothing. Absolutely. Yeah, nothing. Because what did God tell him? Just arise and go down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he, ar he arose and went. So the point I want to make is that, you know, there are times in our lives where we want to know everything before we are willing to obey God. But the instruction of God or the message of God, um, it will come as per what God wants to communicate. So thank God for Philip because he did not uh, keep questioning God and say, God, but who's going to be there? Uh, what am I supposed to do? He just, whatever word he received, he knew, okay, fine, this is all God wants to tell me in this moment. The important thing that I have to do is to just act on it. And so you see in verse 27, so he arose and went. What an obedient man. And he has no clue that he is going to meet a person of great influence. This person has the access uh, to the treasury of you know, Ethiopia. So uh, what was God's plan at this time? To take the gospel to Africa. You understand? It's huge what God is planning in uh, uh, in the spiritual is so amazing uh, but I don't know why God did not communicate that to Philip he just said you get up you go here that's it okay but obedience is what matters uh, and you know without his knowledge Philip was instrumental to take the gospel to a person of influence who would then go on to Africa and you know the, the gospel had the opportunity to spread there so uh, uh, what do we see now so this person was uh, uh, Philip ended up you know meeting this particular person and what was this person doing this person after worship was returning sitting in a chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah uh, now there is another instruction that Philip receives so he goes down to Gaza and here's this man. But the other instruction is go near and overtake the chariot. Okay. So again, you see how the Holy Spirit speaks to his people. It's just a short sentence. Go overtake the chariot. Right? Nothing more than that. Because we're reading Luke's account, we know what's going on. But Philip has no clue. First, go to Gaza. Second, overtake the chariot. What would we do like if you're on the on the road, you know, and you're on your bike and then God says, overtake that car. And you're like, what God, am I hearing you right? Should I even do it? Okay. But Philip, a man of obedience, it says next, so Philip ran to him. He was just acting on the instructions of the Holy Spirit. And this is how we need to be led in our lives. Hear from God. And when God speaks, take that. Next step, we see Philip doing that in his ministry. So he ran up to this man. And uh, when he ran up to this man, something was happening. He heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. But he realized, okay, maybe the reason I'm here is to explain what this actually means. And so he uh, asked this person, Ethiopian eunuch, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch says, oh, how can I understand unless somebody guides me? And then Philip goes ahead. He sits down with him and he starts to read. He describes the humiliation that, uh, you know, the, the Messiah will go through. Uh, and then, you know, he kind of uh, brings uh, this connection. He says, you know, the prophet was actually talking about uh, Jesus Christ. And so 
he preaches the Lord Jesus to this Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, and in verse 35, it says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. Then what happens after that? Okay. Uh, we see in the next verse that the eunuch is willing to be baptized just after he hears about Jesus. So we know that obviously he has accepted Christ, isn't it? When Philip preached, he has accepted Christ. And in the very next moment, when they find some water, he's willing to be baptized. And, uh, you know, Philip uh, is likely the person who actually baptized it. And, uh, uh, you know, he we see that... Uh, after that, uh, again, you know, God continues to speak to him. So uh, in verse 38, right, uh, we notice the baptism of this eunuch takes place. Okay, Philip is the one who has baptized the eunuch. And uh, in verse 39, again, one of the works of the Holy Spirit. So what I'm trying to highlight here is the ministry of the Holy Spirit or the the. Uh, direction of the Holy Spirit and the way the Holy Spirit is uh, working in Philip's life is, is something to for us to desire. So notice what it says about verse 39. Again, Philip has to go. Okay. But how does he go this time? Earlier, we are not told how he actually went, but uh, we, we guess that he went in the normal way. But this time around, we are told that the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. How would you like that? You know, if God wanted uh, you to go to a place to do ministry, uh, and you were sitting in, like, like I'm sitting in Bible college, and the next minute I'm not here, right, in front of the camera. Uh, and I just go someplace to do the ministry, or, you know, something like that happens to you. But the early church lived in all these supernatural experiences and uh, nothing in the Bible tells us that uh, these things can't happen today. Okay, but uh, thank God for Philip who followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. And uh, uh, so then what happens? We see that he goes on and he preaches in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So what can you say about the type of ministry of Philip? We have the fivefold ministry gifts, right? And uh, is there any particular ministry gift that you can attribute to Philip? Yeah, that's true. Supernatural ministry. Yeah, supernatural ministry, but in the fivefold ministry uh, gifts, I we can say evangelist, isn't it? He just went from new place to new place, and then he preached about Jesus. So, uh, an evangelistic ministry, but we still don't see him being called as an evangelist. Okay, so he's just started out, and Luke never terms him as the evangelist yet, because. He's just being led by the Spirit of God. So even this is uh, an important learning for us that when we are serving God, uh, we don't really need to wait for a title. It's all about obedience. Titles will, you know, come eventually when, uh, when people see that God is uh, working through our lives in a certain way. They people also will be able to tell, oh, there is this prophetic gift on the person, or they are so apostolic, or they are so, um, you know, they're such a good teacher. So eventually, people will notice, and uh, you may be termed with the title. But serving God is not so much, uh, you know, about titles. And we see that in the life of uh, Philip. He was not worried about what his title was. And Luke never says uh, evangelist Philip. We just see his ministry. He was obedient. Whatever God told him to do at that point in his life, he kept doing it, you know, and he went on to the next thing. So that's, again, something so beautiful that we can learn from Philip. Just be obedient. Do what God calls you to do. And uh, don't worry so much about the title. The title will come when uh, we fulfill the function. Okay. So uh, I'll pause here before we get into Acts chapter 9. Uh, but any thoughts or any um, comments from you? Maybe 
maybe about the life of uh, Philip. Yeah. Um, so I believe uh, it's very supernatural, and uh, <laughs> sometimes I just wonder how it must have been, how it actually happened. It's like some meditations that we do, <laughs> maybe fast forward the stuff. That's how he goes to the next place, and uh, that's that's really awesome. And uh, I just feel like that the surrenderance and the obedience that he has must be the ultimate reason behind it uh, none of the things of this life is hindering him that's one thing i feel it's more focused on preaching the gospel and the, that's what i believe so because sometimes i mean there's a life that we need to carry on sometimes we focus on that but when we look into the early church the priority was the gospel in, in everything that they do and i'm just asking god <laughs> Let that be my priority too. Sometimes, as we go through life, that that fire they have, that desire they have, uh, I believe that should o overwhelm in, in us, so that we can uh, do whatever God asks us to do. So that's that's one thing I like, and I also liked in verse thirty-five. Uh, not in verse thirty-five. But somewhere it says he's beginning in that scripture he started preaching so that that revelation is good uh philip didn't have to go through something else to start about jesus mm -hmm. i wonder which verse it says yeah, yeah in verse 35 in 35 then philip opened his mouth beginning at this scripture uh, uh it's like touching him right at the point i believe so uh what he was reading and uh, that might be the work of the Holy Spirit behind everything. Even he was reading the right scripture. But I still believe that sometimes we have to pe touch people right at where they are in need of. right what Because uh, not everyone requires the gospel in the same way. I believe that's why we have youth ministry, children ministry. Because we have to touch them right at their point. If, we are, if I look back into my life even, I've heard gospel for all my life. But then only when it touched right at the point where I am in, that's when I, I got saved. That made me believe more in Jesus. So the revelation is also so big. I believe that in the early church, they know where to preach, when to preach, how to preach. That's that's awesome. They have a clear picture when they have to be a little more uh, vigorous or arrogant. They are arrogant there. And when they have to be silent, when they have to shut their mouth, they are silent in that places. And I think that's that's how, maybe that's how Holy Spirit leads us. He tells us exactly uh, what to do. So yeah, that's one thing that stood out for me when I when I saw that beginning in that scripture he started he started about Jesus too. So yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jafina, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, and Rosalind says, uh, Philip is very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. True. You know, that uh, also uh, stands out for us. Uh, she adds, uh, we too should have a relationship with the Holy Spirit in such a way that we don't miss the call of God and things that God wants to do through us to bless others, keeping every distraction away and out of our lives. Uh, thank you. Okay. Sure, Rosalind, correct. To be so sensitive and uh, response, responsive to God is uh, important for us to walk in what God wants us to do. And as I pointed out earlier, the instructions that God may give us, may seem very small. But in the kingdom of God, some of those things can be so strategic. Like, when the church is beginning to grow in the early, uh, you know, the first century, and uh, Philip is just traveling, you know, here and there, one with one sentence, two sentences 
he is led to a man who will take the gospel to an entire continent and that's the beginning of the spread of the uh, gospel in that particular continent of africa right so uh, it it is important as uh, you know rosalind is pointing out to just be obedient to god even if it's a small instruction because in god's uh, perspective when we obey that small command it might make the difference to a continent full of people we don't know isn't it uh, and so you know that is something to really uh, think about and uh, finally you know, one more thing that i'll quickly point out about philip is both in samaria and the ethiopian you know it says rejoicing there was great uh, joy in the land and then the ethiopian eunuch went back rejoicing so when uh, we are led by god in such a timely way he went to both these places and people were receptive they accepted the truth uh, and uh, what did that produce in the lives of the people when they received the gospel rejoicing okay so uh, the ethiopian you know he seems so devout we don't know for how many years he was searching for the messiah but that was the moment right just that moment that uh, philip comes and says okay you know what are you reading do you understand what you're reading okay he sits down with him and he begins to explain but maybe the quest of an entire lifetime was met on that particular day but the result the choice in the lives of people when we take the gospel out and you know maybe another insight is uh see god wants us to take the gospel to everyone we uh, obviously saw him earlier taking it out to the to the regular people in samaria but now there is a person of influence so as we go ahead in the book of acts we notice that every strata of society people in business you know people in the prison people uh, men women uh, so just talk about it in every sector very intelligent people uh, like you know athens the city of athens so business people the city of corinth was known for all uh, corinth that uh, ephesus particularly you know was known for uh, uh, all their business acumen but the gospel impacts everyone it doesn't matter what walk of life people come from but because we are created in the image of god and each one of us is in need of salvation uh, the gospel is the timely gospel and effective in the life of every single human being that is also something that we notice okay so i'll just go back to the chat here and rosalind says uh, like god told me to go to the certain place to do prayer work but i did not obey because of my laziness and fear but i learned it a hard way oh, okay i uh, thank god for his mercy okay thank you for sharing uh, rosalind uh, i know like even in our lives sometimes we just regret not having uh, listened to god uh, but hopefully we will become more sensitive to know his voice accurately and then act on it so uh, any other any other comments before we jump to acts chapter 9 all right so uh, if we are through then we shall now start to talk about uh, apostle paul yeah, eventually he'll be apostle paul but uh, right now he is the persecutor saul who was introduced to us and this is around 38 ad uh, and we will see what exactly happens to him uh, on a road called as on the road to damascus so let's begin to read from verse 1 here we could read till verse 9 please when saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the lord 
went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So uh, we see the encounter uh, that Saul had. Uh, something that we can observe about his about his uh, convictions is that he felt that whatever he was doing, he was doing it right. Uh, and so uh, we see that he intentionally planned to persecute those who followed Jesus. Uh, we are told that uh, he went to the high priest and asked letters uh, from him to the synagogues of Damascus. So meaning he officially was going place to place to persecute the believers. And now what's happening? Uh, he is going in search of so that if he found any who were of the way, uh, okay, one more thing for us to notice is that the believers, the collective name of the believers, till now, they are not really referred to as Christians, right? Nowhere you, you find their names uh, as Christians. We've so, seen terms such as believers, uh, you know, disciples and all that earlier, but uh, he who believes. But right now, a collective term to to refer to those who are following Christ is the way. So what was Saul doing? He was trying to find people who are part of the way. What is this way? Uh, maybe, you know, they were talking about the way for salvation, the way to, to live your life. So it was a, a new manner of uh, uh, living life and a new faith that, uh, you know, people found. And so maybe that's why they called it the way or a manner of life. And uh, uh, Paul was against the people who were part of the way. Again, scriptures say whether men or women uh, showing how brutal he was, uh, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he was on an agenda. That is why he went to Damascus. Now, what happens as he's going to Damascus, you know, he hears a voice with uh, a sentence. It says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, we know uh, that whenever we hear a word being repeated, right, twice, uh, that is expressing deep emotion, okay, of some sort. So, uh, God is just trying to say like, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Even at that time, Jesus used her name twice. Okay. So because it, he was, he was in his heart, uh, just wanting to convince her to put her trust in the Lord. And uh, even now, Saul, he looks at Saul and he's like, Saul, Saul, with deep emotion. Why are you persecuting? What does it say? Anyone? Why are you persecuting? Me. Me. Okay, that's another very important thing. You remember when Stephen was martyred, we saw Jesus stand up, it says, right? And I told all of us, stand up is like a symbol of uh, uh, honor. Jesus, we know, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. 
but standing up is a symbol of appreciating someone for their work or their labor so for the persecuted church what is god's heart you see the martyrs stephen saw christ stand up which means god honored the martyr jesus honored the martyr and now again you know, we we see uh, uh, when who's being persecuted we saw the people of the way right the other ones were being persecuted but what is the voice from heaven saying or who, what is uh, jesus saying to saul 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 why are you persecuting me so uh, that shows us how god feels about persecution so we may think that god has forgotten god is not uh, mindful uh, i am the only one who has to go through you know this the kind of persecution we go through maybe somebody says something maximum right uh, about us and we don't like it or oh, look at you you're such a holy joe or something and we feel persecuted for that but think about uh, people in the book of acts literally physically they are, they are being hurt and uh, they are uh, being bound taken into prisons but in the midst of all that one thing that we can know is when we experience the pain of persecution who feels it jesus feels it and that's why he's telling saul you know what you're not persecuting these people you are persecuting me why are you persecuting me wow it's like a parent standing up for their kids isn't it uh, that you feel that uh, anger behind that statement where deep emotion god from heaven is speaking to paul saul and saying saul saul why are you persecuting me okay so let's stop here we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back and so much more to uh, learn about paul's encounter okay see you all in 10 minutes thank you